Thank you so much, um, Claude. That was very kind. And it's truly an honor and a pleasure to be here. And like Claude said, uh, Professor Scott Hammer has helped the Thai Red Cross AIDS Research Center since its inception. And you have always been you know, someone that we highly regard in Thailand and, and always you know, will. And with Claude, of course, she's a handful, but uh, <laughs> I, also a great person. So I put up with her and her, all her doings. And, and I, I, of course, love working with Louise and Elaine, who's great. And I hear, you know, she, everyone does what she says around here. So, and she's not here today, but uh, I'll catch up with her. But uh, I'd like to spend about 40 minutes to share with you some of the work that I've done on uh, early ART, on the, its effect on the body and the brain. And really, the negative effects that HIV has on the body I think stems from the fact that it can live in the body for a very long time. And in the peripheral blood, when HIV infects a cell, it replicates, and then the virion can go on to infect another cell. Now, this probably happens mostly in people who are not treated with antiretroviral therapy. Once someone is treated and have suppressive viral load in the blood, this probably doesn't happen as much, this ongoing cell-to-cell -cell replication. But what happens more is what we call homeostatic proliferation. What this is, is that a CD4 T cell that has HIV inside of it, it's lay quiescent, so it can't be detected by the immune system. The HIV medication can't kill it, but it can actually proliferate continuously for long periods of time, so it can maintain HIV persistence in the body indefinitely. And we also know that HIV can replicate in tissue like the brain, the genital tract, the lymph nodes, and the gut. And recent evidence has shown that in these tissues, actually, HIV medication doesn't penetrate very well. So there is indeed ongoing viral replication in the tissue that further fuels HIV persistence. So when we have HIV that persists and replicates, what happens? What happens is that it can feel immune activation. It can cause CD4 depletion, ongoing immune dysfunction. And those things are also bad for HIV persistence and replication. And you can imagine if you have immune activation, that can stimulate further replication. If your immune system can't control HIV, then that's also bad. So when we treat someone with HIV with medication, what we want to see is lower reservoir, lower immune activation, and preserve immunity so that the immune system can actually counteract HIV. So I'd like to talk about some studies covering from infancy to adults. In infant, I'll talk a little bit about immune development and its relevant to HIV reservoir. In older children, adolescent, about HIV effects on the brain, and then early ART, on reservoir immunity in blood and tissue in the adults. So I'll focus on some key questions. In the infants and children, I'd like to talk about whether there are unique immune development considerations that may affect how HIV persists in the body. And what does timing of ART, how does that affect the brain and brain function? In the adults with acute HIV infection, I'd like to uh, touch on what ART, if you manage to start people early enough, what can it do and what, can it, what can't it do in terms of mitigating reservoir and preserving immunity? And then the last part, I'd like to talk about the relevance of early treatment and HIV remission. Does treating early actually help to get someone to HIV remission? And what might such a treatment look like? And you can imagine, you know, there's daily medication that's easy to take. Why would anyone want to participate in such a trial? And then I'll end with a short movie that is an interview of four Thais who are living with HIV, and they will tell us what HIV cure means to them. And so I hope that this will be useful to you and would somehow help in your work and, and the way that um, you do research or, or treat patients. And I look forward to your questions at the end. So first of all, when we talk about infant immune development, are, these, are there unique qualities that may affect HIV persistence? 
I think what is the most important is CD4 development because CD4 is the main cell that HIV actually infects and stay alive for a long time. So when you look at CD4 T cell, it starts off at a naive cell, and then when it gets stimulated by antigen or infection, it goes through development through the different memory CD4 T cells, and then when it gets to terminally differentiated, then it dies. So the fact that how each cell can actually host latency, when I say host latency, I mean it can have HIV inside its cell for a long time, and this is actually a balance between having some activation and also having long survival. And so studies in adults have shown that the cell that probably hosts latency the most is the central memory CD4 T cell. But with infants, what is very relevant is the naive CD4 T cells, because infants are mostly born with naive CD4 T cells, and these T cells are actually relatively resistant to HIV. And so in our study in Thailand that we started last year, trying to enroll newly infected infants around the country, we only have about 80 in the whole country newly infected each year. And here are infants, five infants who are about two months of age before they started treatment. And you can see the proportion of the different CD4 subsets. And about 60 to 80% of the CD4 of these infants are actually naive CD4 T cells, which, I, like I said, was, are relatively resistant to HIV. And this is even true when children grow older, but they were treated earlier. This is data comparing Thai children who were treated at about four months of age and are now about six years old compared to Thai adults who were treated even earlier at, at about two weeks following infection but have been on treatment for about a couple of years. And here, if you look at the proportion of CD4 T cells that are naive cells, the children have a much, much higher proportion of these cells. And when we look at the central memory CD4 T cells that are the prime target for HIV latency, the children have much less of these cells. So these are favorable qualities that if we manage to identify children and treat them early enough, they could have very good outcome. And in the same children who we now continue to follow, we measure the total HIV reservoir size in their peripheral blood cells. And we look at how much DNA they have and compared to the Visconti cohort, and these are French people who have been in HIV remission for a long time. They've, they're not on treatment and they have suppressive viremia. Most of our children actually have reservoir size that are lower than the Visconti HIV remission cases. And you might say, well, a lot of the DNA are actually dead. And so how do we know that cells that are able to produce virus, how, how many of those still exists. So here are some preliminary data looking at, at active reservoir size. So what we did here is that uh, Nicholas Schomont uses the cells from the children and then maximally stimulate it to produce more virus. And then we measure the cell-associated RNA. So you can see that in the infants before ART, it's not surprising they have a lot of productive cells, productively infected cells. But post-ART is only 12 months after treatment. And the majority of children have undetectable or below detection in terms of cells that are able to produce virus. On the right are the older children who have been on treatment for about six years. They also have fewer cells that are capable of producing RNA despite maximal stimulation. So I think these are preliminary data, but we are hopeful that if children are able to start treatment early enough, they actually would have I, I believe much more favorable profile compared to early treated adults. Now, immediate diagnosis treatment of infants have been the standard of care for a long time, but the uptake in resource limited setting is still low. And I think at least in Thailand, this, this uh, you know, added benefit of lowering the reservoir has really ignited the, the people in Thailand and families to, to really try to start treatment earlier. Now, I'd like to talk about timing of ART and the brain, the, uh, the study that Claude has already mentioned, PREDICT study. We started this study many years ago, now over 10 years ago, and 
This was done in Thailand and Cambodia. We enrolled almost 300 children who were well, had relatively good CD4, 15 to 24 percent, which is around 350 to 500 cell count. We randomized them to starting right away or deferred treatment, which at that time was the standard of care. And this was actually better than the standard of care because 15 percent is about 350 and standard of care was 200. So we looked at AIDS-free survival, and we saw that it was not different between the arms. Because these children are the surviving kids. They, they already survived intact, and they were about six years of age. And so starting at 350 or slightly less, you know, they still did well. But we were worried whether brain function would be the same, whether deferring treatment per standard of care was bad for neurocognitive uh, function. So we had a neurocognitive uh, sub-study that we looked at different uh, domains of function, and I'm just showing you the IQ scores here. And this is seven years later, and so you see four groups of kids here. The HIV positive are the first two, immediate arm versus deferred arm. And then we had two uh, control groups, one exposed to HIV, so they were born to mothers who had HIV infection, and one were HIV unexposed. So if you look at the full-scale verbal performance IQ, you can see clearly that the immediate and deferred group did the same. There was no benefit to starting earlier in, in these older children, but they both did worse than the HIV-negative group. What we think is happening here is, is that the brain insult in children probably occurs very early, as we have seen data from South Africa showing that if kids are treated before three months of age, they did much better. So when, when brain insult occurs very early, then in the surviving children, they have a kind of a mild but static neurocognitive impairment. And this is despite having you know, good outcome in terms of viral suppression and higher CD4 after treatment. So we're worried that with this mild, stable neurocognitive impairment, how, they, how would they do in the long run? How does that affect their brain growth? So we also do longitudinal MRI scan with brain morphometry and diffuse tensor imaging, looking at connectivity. And here is just an example. The top panel is from a five-year-old HIV-negative boy. The bottom panel is from an hiv positive uh, six-year-old boy. And this is looking at uh, the amygdala that is part of the temporal lobe that is important for memory processing, decision-making, emotional reaction. And you can see in the HIV-negative boy, there's a gradual growth of the amygdala over three years. In the HIV-positive boy, there's hardly any growth. It's static. So something like this is worth following throughout adolescent, particularly brain growth is not constant throughout. The amygdala will go through a steep growth in adolescence, and so we want to see whether there are effects on HIV and treatment on brain growth, and we're doing this uh, continuing now also. So as children grow and survive into older childhood and into adolescence, what will happen would be that they could grow into their deficits. So the mild abnormalities that we see now in children who are 10 years old may become more of a problem when they're 15 and they're asked to do more complicated tasks. And so we are worried about their executive function and decision-making abilities. And, you know, I, I'm, Claude knows best what a teenage brain looks like. So, so this is Claude's version of a, an average teenage brain, which is that a large part is used for processing love and rebellion and Facebook and, and those types of things. And you can see the back of the brain is tiny bit for processing memory for chores and homework. So, so when we have, you know, teenage time is, is so difficult already, and if you also have HIV and neurocognitive impairment despite mild, how, how does that affect the teenager? So talking with Claude, I, I became very convinced, and I am very convinced now, that what we should look at is resilience. 
because we all have known people who go through very difficult circumstances and they come out okay. And so what determines who will do well? And so we can learn from this cohort that we have followed from when they were six years old now to the 11th year, how they do, who do well, and why. And so I'd like to share with you a, a story of one child that I've known for 15 years. Her name is Ploy, and she's now 22 years old. Uh, she first came to our clinic when she was about 10. She just lost her parents then and was sent to the Northeast to live with her uh, paternal grandmother. And her grandmother was not at all a loving figure in her life, kept Ploy at home, wouldn't let her go to school, wouldn't let her have friends because she was afraid the neighbors would know that she had HIV. And she said, there's no use because you'll be like your parents. And, 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 and she would even threaten to take her ARV away if she disobeyed. So Ploy now is 22. She managed to convince her grandmother to let her go to school one day a week and spent many years finishing high school, has two-year education in technical college, and now is a, like a salesperson in a store, and has dreams to do more. And, but one thing is that throughout from age 10 to 22, she has never missed one dose of ARV. And so you, you, and then this, she loves drawing, and we would have to take art supplies to her house. And this is what she said when she was only 13. I can grow like a tree that is able to rise strong and full of life. So you think about kids like this, what, you know, despite all this that's happening to them, how do they stay strong and, and keep uh, being positive and, and being adherent to ARV? And so in our study in PREDICT, we will be looking at resilience outcomes, which means that having at least average uh, academic achievement, cognition, few mental health symptoms, uh, adherent to ARV, no drug or alcohol use. And then we'll look at all these factors through very detailed interviews and, and questionnaires. And what we want to see is what are the determinants of resilience in the HIV positive children and in the HIV negative children. And we will also look at brain imaging in those who had neuroimaging done before adolescence and throughout adolescence. And then through Claude's contact, we will have an opportunity to compare our data with people that have studies from South Africa and the US to really try to come up with, with something that we could use to design interventions that would help other children become resilient. So, as you saw with Ploy, it is so difficult for families to communicate about HIV. And so when Claude, again, all good ideas come from Claude, and, and, um, and when she said, well, we have this intervention, and I said, well, this might be perfect for Thailand, I have to tell you it has been life transforming for many children and families, is that this uses a cartoon-based uh, curriculum to bring families and children together and to jumpstart conversation about difficult issues like grief, like accepting HIV, having boyfriend, love, living positively. And it does group intervention with youth alone, with caregivers alone, and then together. And in Thailand particularly, the culture is, is such that children are never right. The parents are always right, and if you disagree and don't obey your caregivers, that's a great sin. So it's even more than the regular teenage stuff that goes on. And so having this is, is, has been really helpful to try to improve the communication. And now we have uh, just completed a randomized trial of CHAMP to, to use it as a tool to decrease risk risk behavior as well as poor adherence and so on. And, and actually the pictures are drawn by one of our parents. And so we're also now talking about maybe implementing this widely in Thailand as well as in other countries in Southeast Asia. So um, I'd like to now come to the part about the adults with acute infection. And what we want to see here or, or what we want to assess whether ART can do or not do is whether it can really reduce or eliminate reservoir. Can it increase HIV-specific immunity? Can it decrease immune activation? So 
Before I go to the data, I'd like to share with you how we stage acute infection, and this is how other groups have done too. We use the FEBIC staging, and acute infection is really the first month after infection. And here, the x-axis show days following HIV transmission. This is a graph of the viral load. When the virus comes into the body, that's the eclipse phase. So it's already in the tissue, but it's not yet detected in the blood. Once it's detected in the blood, that's FEBIC1, which is only about two weeks following onset of infection. And that's where RNA is positive only. And then when P24 antigen becomes positive, then that's FEBIC2. And that's, again, only five days later. When HIV IgM, or antibody, becomes positive, then that's FEBIC3. In FEBIC4, then the Western blot is indeterminate. So you can see this is how we determine how long people have been infected. And it's an incredibly dynamic stage that is very brief. So in our study in Thailand, um, it took a lot to start this study because no one thought that it can be done. And we, uh, we started this in 2009, screen in real time samples from clients that walk in to the Thai Red Cross Anonymous Clinic, which is the largest HIV testing center in Southeast Asia. And we screen in real time with pool nucleic acid testing and serology. We've identified about 500 people, but able to contact and enroll about 340 or so. And we offer immediate ART. We have optional procedures, and we move very fast. We enroll every single day. It doesn't matter if it's Saturday, Sunday, holiday, or we do MRI at 5 AM. And it's all sorts of things to try to do as fast as possible. And so by history, the median of duration of infection is about 18 days at enrollment. You can see the first two stages are the hardest to find because they have to actually walk in during that very brief period. And we have about 15 to 20% in that very early stage. And the majority of our participants are young MSM. So I'd like to show you what the events in acute infection really determines what happens in the rest of that person's life um, is, in terms of reservoir, is to, this is looking at total HIV DNA in the peripheral blood cells, comparing two cohorts that the US Army has been involved in. The, in the blue line are the untreated acutes. This is run by Dr. Merlin Robb at the military before treatment was universal uh, everywhere. And the RV254 is the cohort I just talked about. So if you look here, the DNA, people come into the study at about two weeks following infection. By two weeks in the study, the DNA has peaked. And then that peak, and very, it changes very little after that, determines the reservoir size and in chronic infection. And in the treated acute, it comes down. So by two weeks, the difference is already 20-fold. And by three years, it's 300-fold difference between the treated and untreated group. And we know from studies from others that if people start treatment in chronic infection, the reservoir size changes very little. And so really the opportunity to do the best to re reduce the reservoir sizes with early treatment. Now, another way that in pediatric we've been using for a long time as a marker of low reservoir size is HIV zero negativity. But this has not been done in adults very much. And so here we use the most sensitive serology testing. So if someone walks into a clinic for HIV testing, this is likely going to be the test they would get, is an antigen-antibody combo assay. And we looked at who still remained seronegative by week 24. And week 24 means that they've been infected for more than six months. And you can see that people who are treated in FEBIC1 treated in the first two weeks of infection, 61% remain negative by the most sensitive serology test. And so this has several implications. First is we have to tell people that this doesn't mean they're cured, because people really want, you know, want to think that, but it's because of the early treatment. And we've had our participants who, we, we were, who told us or we were told by other colleagues that have gone to various clinics to get tested to see if they are indeed negative. In Thailand, this is a very good thing because the discrimination against HIV is still so significant. And if you go look for a job, almost always they'll do HIV testing. And it's so hard for people with HIV to get a job. So the fact that they're HIV negative is, is wonderful. 
So, but this zero negativity goes down significantly once people just go on for another five days and go into FIBIC2. And so you can see that every day that passes in acute infection matters a lot, and, and we, don't, we should not let a day pass, you know, just, just try as much as possible. We often start treatment on the same day. Yeah, please. In the infants nowadays, yes. This is in adults, yeah. So they're they're infected behaviorally uh, through sex, mostly MSM. This these are these are the adults. Uh, in in the previous cohort, the nowadays. Uh, in Thailand, the prevention of mother to child transmission is, is covers about you know ninety five percent so that 's why in Thailand, there are fifteen thousand women with HIV that deliver every year, but there 's only eighty infected so it, it, it is a very successful program, but we still have but these are from the adults that were treated very early, so they 're mostly young men who had HIV through sex. So I think the most important message for today is, is this slide, is that in terms of reservoir size, what you end up is with is what you start with is what you end up with. So here on the x-axis is the DNA levels at baseline before treatment, and the y-axis is after treatment. And these are infection of the different memory CD4 subsets in the people that we did leukophoresis, got billions of cells and measure the infection. And you can see that if you start high, even after years of treatment that is successful with plasma viral load undetectability, you will end up having higher reservoir. And, and so once HIV gets in the cell, it's, it's so hard to, to get it out or to do anything with it. So the best way is to prevent it by doing early treatment. So some people say, well, if you start treatment so early, then people have not had time to develop immunity against HIV. And in the long run, that's not good. I would argue that maybe quantity-wise, that's true. But quality-wise, I don't think it's true. Because this is just an example of looking at CD8 T cells that are important to killing infected cells. And if you look at the FIBIC1 people, and here we look at function of CD8 by the number of cytokines it can produce. And producing more cytokine is better. So in the frequency of cells that produce two or three cytokines, the phoebic ones have, have those cells available. And we see the same with B cell precursor and other types of cells. So I think that early treatment is preserving the right type of cells we might want in the long run. Now, in the tissue, I'd like to just talk about the gut. The gut is important because a lot of the CD4 in the body is actually in the gut. And so if you measure HIV in one piece of gut, it has more HIV than you measure in, in generally in the blood. So here, looking at the amount of total HIV DNA in gut tissue in the different phoebic stages, and you can see after treatment, the levels come down. And the earlier the treatment is started, the lower the levels is. And so gut inflammation is also important. We, we've heard a lot about inflammation in the gut that is very intense, and then it remains with high inflammation and cause microbial translocation and, and clinical outcome afterwards. So here we look at a marker of inflammation, type 1 interferon response in the FIBIC 1, 2 versus 3 plus at baseline 24 weeks and 96 weeks after treatment. You can see at acute infection and the staining of brown down here, there's intense inflammation in the gut. But with early treatment, it's completely wiped out. And this is not seen when treatment is instituted in chronic infection. However, when Jake Estes from NIH, he measured the amount of CD4 in the gut, it doesn't fully recover. So there's incomplete recovery of CD4 T cells in the tissue. And when he looked for cells that are able to produce RNA, so actively producing cells, there are still those cells even after years of treatment in acute infection. And we also look at lymph node tissue and we see the same thing. So we think that the fact that we observe that there is ongoing inflammation by measuring immune markers in the blood may be because of incomplete immune recovery 
and ongoing viral replication in tissue. And here we look at soluble CD14, which is a monocyte activation marker, and it has been shown to correlate with morbidities in HIV and, and mortality as well. And you can see here that compared to HIV negative ties, the acutely treated participants still have levels higher. I mean, they're lower than chronically treated people, but they have not completely normalized after two years. So what this means is that maybe we need longer treatment, two years, even early treatment is not enough, or do we need to add an anti-inflammatory agents to ART to try to really counteract this long-term uh, inflammation that we continue to see in HIV? And so we have a study that is now ongoing looking at telmisartan, which is an anti-inflammatory agent, plus ART in acute infection to see if that would actually mitigate the immune activation. Now, about the brain, I'd like to just show you a few slides. Uh, in about 50 to 60% of participants, they have some neurologic signs. And these are attentive uh, cognitive symptoms, motor findings. You know, when you do the finger tapping, they, they don't do as fast, or neuropathy. But what is interesting is that people who have higher plasma viral load actually have more neurologic symptoms at acute infection, and also, people who have depression symptoms have lower CD4 and higher viral load at time of acute infection. And depression symptoms also correlate with having higher levels of inflammatory biomarkers in the blood and in the CSF. So I think this intense immune activation, replication in acute infection, you know, there's biological factors that are affecting neurologic symptoms as well as mental health symptoms. After treatment, the people who had neurologic symptoms and depression, anxiety symptoms, that goes down significantly. And actually, in terms of the CSF, we see very good outcome. All of our patients have undetectable viral load in the CSF. The inflammatory biomarkers go completely normal. So we think that, at least in the brain, early treatment is really suppressing inflammation. and, and um, we are continuing to look at brain imaging as well in acute infection. So what can early treatment do and not do? I would say it reduces the reservoir significantly but does not eliminate it. It can partially reverse immune damage. Certainly it's much better than when treatment is started late, but it does not really normalize the CD4 recovery in tissue. And immune activation, we see partially reduced activation. We see complete normalization in the gut, in the CSF, but yet not yet in the blood. So coming to the last part of the talk, does early ART actually increase the chance of HIV remission? So here are our goals of HIV care research. Of course, our ultimate goal is eradication. We want to be able, oh, okay. I, I, I'm like uh, waking everyone up and doing a <laughs> disco effect <laughs> to, uh, start dancing now. So the goals is, is eradication, and that is you know, getting rid of all cells capable of producing HIV, and, and that is very, very difficult to achieve. So the more achievable near-term goal is HIV remission, which is to be able to come off ART, but have undetectable plasma viral load, be healthy, and at no increased risk of transmission compared to people who are on treatment. So, so far, there have been two ways to achieve remission. And here, this is a graph showing time off treatment versus viral load. And you can see the first line in blue. That's a typical patient. If you stop someone now, they will rebound within two months. But we have had cases that have had uh, transient remission, or Timothy Brown has had long-term remission, even perhaps eradication. And this is from bone marrow transplantation. But we certainly don't want that to be the regular treatment we need for HIV remission. The other way is early treatment, and we have seen this in the Mississippi baby, as well as in various cohorts in adults. But HIV remission is rare. I mean, if you look at millions of people around the world, many, many people don't have remission, and many cohorts don't report any remission cases. And so I think of acute infection as an opportunity to intervene and as a step in the journey 
towards HIV remission. So if we can identify acute infection, start treatment early enough, we can curve the HIV replication. We really need to find ways to optimize ART so that it can penetrate the tissue better. As clinicians, the most important thing you can do is try to help your patients as much as possible to keep virally suppressed, even if they start treatment late, because, I mean, that will make them better candidates for future intervention. And then there are many interventions being studied now. We could use drugs to reactivate the cells to show itself, reactivate latency so it can be killed. We can institute antibody, vaccine, uh, immune, there's trials looking at engineered T cells. These are all in, uh, in first phase and in clinical trials. Try to kill the remaining latently infected cells in order to achieve HIV remission. And I think this is a, a, a period where there will be lots of, of disappointments and, and it's so important to have parallel social, behavioral, and ethics research to really understand how to do this in the best way possible. So what might HIV treatment, remission treatment look like? No one knows, and this is my guess. I, I think that we will not have a treatment that is so powerful that you can give it and people would go into remission. What we might have would be a bunch of treatments that have modest efficacy, but safe enough that we might be able to give in combination in longer term. So if you have someone who's suppressive on suppressive ART, we might consider giving daily dosing of some agent to, re to modify the latency, or uh, induce latency, and then you would come in with repeat doses of immune intervention, such as vaccine, engineered T cells, or antibody. And then when someone hit a set of biomarkers, and this set of bio biomarkers is not known now, but through the studies we're doing and others are doing, we hope to find some predictors of what might, might be related to remission. When people hit that, they would go through treatment interruption with being monitored very carefully. And then some people might remain in remission with viral load suppression. Some people might rebound early or later, then they would start treatment and then the viral load would come down again. That may be what we might be looking at in, in the near future. So you say, well, that doesn't look so good. <laughs> Why would someone <laughs> want to do that? So I want to share with you a real experience from our trial that we're starting now with treatment interruption studies and what our potential trial participants think. So we have the RV254 cohort. We have people with low reservoir, preserved immunity. Now we have a bunch of studies. The first one has already started, RV411. We're looking at whether treatment super, super early alone, what does that do? How about giving antibody, giving vaccine, or giving combination therapy? And then looking at treatment interruption, they're followed very carefully with finger stick uh, viral load every three days in order to resume treatment immediately if they rebound. So all the RV254 people are potential tri participants of these trials. So we did a, a behavioral study uh, with uh, UNC, and we gave them a fact sheet before the survey, and this is what we told them. You may be asked to start using experimental drug or stop your ART. We don't have much experience. We don't know if it'll work. We don't know if it's safe, and it probably won't help with your health. Okay, so, um, so then we asked them then what, what they think about this. So, so then we asked about benefit and risk. Do you think there's a definite or big chance or no or small chance? So how about personal benefit? 64% said that they believe they would have definite or big chance of personal benefit. And then even more people said scientific benefits. And very few people said no or small chance. And how about harm? 36% said they know a small chance of harm, and you know, a little bit more said personal harm. So then we ask, well, would you, be, would you intend to participate in, in these things? And so very somewhat I will participate, or not at all, not very likely. So 60% said they would somewhat stop ART, and 16% not very likely. And 68% said they would take experimental drug, and 4% said not. But the interesting thing is that there was no correlation between what they answer on the left side and on the right side. So, but, but, this, but this, to me, as a researcher, is very concerning, because 
this is more than we can ever deliver. We, I know that most people coming into these trials will fail because it's an early phase trial. What we're trying to do is trying to find biomarkers that would relate to time to viral load rebound. We think most people will rebound, but they may rebound at a different time. And so if you think of remission as delaying viral load rebound, if you can delay from two months to six months and then later on to one year and two years, you're making progress. But this is very different to what they think. And so we are very lucky that you know, the UNC team now, I think, got a very good score for their R01 that will look at this in longitudinally. So we will be interviewing people who come into the trial or who decline and longitudinally what they think as they fail or they succeed and afterwards. And what we're trying to do here is trying to find the right way to communicate HIV remission trials to potential trial participants and to the community at large. And, and I think this is so important for all the CURE trials that are going ahead. So I've talked to you about various things. And in infants, I believe that they potentially can have the best outcome. But it's so important that we can start them early enough. And for adolescents, I think that we have to really assess very carefully this phenomenon of going into deficits and determinants of resilience and help them to assim assim assimilate in the workplace as best as they can. And in the adults, timing matters. I mean, don't, please don't let even a day pass if you can. If you find someone in acute infection, that's their best shot to, to have the lowest reservoir. And so I, I am so grateful to, to the study participants, the children, the adults, and their families. You know, what they do for us is really humbling. And, and the sponsors and all the um, collaborators, you know, in many places uh, for here, Claude and, and the industry sponsors. And I'd like to end with a movie that um, Taran and Gabe made for me. And I showed this at the International AIDS Society a few years ago. And uh, just hold on. And, and it is about four Thais that have been living with HIV. Uh, and you know, we asked them, what does HIV cure mean to you? So if you can start that.